Digital Foundry is sponsored by Backedface, the leader in crash and error reporting for game developers. Click on the link in the video description and sign up for your free trial today. Big Navi. Yeah, we're back on the PC hardware coverage side. Somewhat delayed owing to the arrival of next generation consoles, but I've been itching to get back into the saddle because with the arrival of the AMD Radeon RX 6800 and 6800 XT, we finally, finally see AMD bring the fight to Nvidia at the high end. Something that hasn't really happened since, well, Fury X 2015. There's good news this time though, principally because Smart Engineering is delivering a very impressive product overall. And in some respects, AMD is actually out engineering Nvidia and doing so with actual tangible results. These are great GPUs, no doubt about it. But there's also a bit of bad news too. Despite architecting the next generation consoles with ray tracing support and machine learning features, it's no real secret at this point that AMD is well off the pace here up against the RTX 30 series competition. Before we discuss how well these cards perform in a wide selection of games, let's briefly set some expectations. At $580 and $650 respectively, the RX 6800 and 6800 XT slot in above the $500 3070 and below the $700 3080, the Nvidia competition. And this suggests that we'll see better performance from the 6800 up against 3070 while the 6800 XT would do well to draw with the higher priced Nvidia card. As well as much improved performance, these big Navi products also mark the PC debut of AMD's RDNA 2 architecture, which also forms the basis of both PlayStation 5 and Xbox series consoles. Like those next gen machines, the RX 6000 series supports hardware accelerated ray tracing, finally ending Nvidia's RT monopoly, plus a raft of other DirectX 12 Ultimate features like direct storage, variable rate shading and mesh shaders that can boost performance in various ways. And speaking of performance boosting, AMD's engineers have also added features like smart access, memory, rage mode overclocking and an infinity cache that should all come together to push these cards closer to their theoretical limits. So let's take a look at the new products. While spec sheets can be a bit boring, looking at this one tells you quite a lot this time around. And uh, yeah, RDNA 2 is driven by substantially higher clock speeds across the board and a larger complement of more individually performant compute units. The upcoming 6900 XT, which we hope to look at soon, gets the full array of the Navi 21 processor's 80 compute units while 6800 XT drops down to 72, 6800 cutting back to a mere 60. Still a huge increase over Little Navi though, right? Extra clocks and the brand new Infinity Cache separate RX 6000 from 5000, but there's also a bunch of new architectural features like INT4 and INT8 extensions for better machine learning support, plus dedicated ray tracing hardware baked into each CU which is 10 times faster at calculating ray intersections as opposed to a purely software driven approach. These compute improvements are backed with this innovative new memory solution. By pairing the 16 gigs of GDDR6 video memory with a 128 megabyte cache, uh, which is similar to the L3 cache on Ryzen processors, well, AMD is able to achieve some blistering results from the card's relatively pedestrian 256-bit bus. According to Team Red, the system provides 2.17 times the bandwidth you'd expect from a standard 256-bit interface. This boost in bandwidth helps offset the greater compute unit count and higher clock frequencies while keeping power consumption under control. It's a clever move that means that Nvidia's advantage from its early adoption of the likely more expensive and definitely more performant GDDR6X memory on RTX 3080 is at least partially mitigated. It also means that AMD can afford to offer 16 gigs of VRAM on both models, which puts clear water between both of the new AMD cards and their closest Nvidia counterparts. This 16 gigs of VRAM can also be accessed easily on Ryzen 5000 systems with AMD's Smart Access Memory Technology, SAM, a performance enhancing feature we'll be taking a quick look at later. 
That just about wraps up the architectural improvements inside. So what about the industrial design outside? Obviously, we're going to be seeing custom RX 6800 and 6800 XT products from a wide range of AMD partners, but the ones we've got here today are AMD's reference versions. While these GPUs are set to retail at the base MSRP, uh, hopefully availability allowing, they feel like anything but entry-level designs with an impressive three-fan axial cooler, plenty of metal fins to dissipate heat, and a more complex aluminium shroud compared to the boxy Radeon 7. Overall, AMD's Radeon RX 6000 cards are weighty and feel very well constructed with no give or flex evident anywhere. The vanilla RX 6800 feels particularly dense with a more compact two-slot solution, while the 2.5-slot design of the RX 6800 XT provides more room for the higher-powered cards to breathe. These designs are a huge step forward from the blower-style RX 5700 series cards and should perform much better in standard PCs with adequate airflow. In terms of ports, we're looking at a slightly different layout compared to NVIDIA's RTX 30 series cards. You get one HDMI 2.1 in common with Ampere, but this time there's two DisplayPort 1.4 outputs and one USB-C output, which of course can be used as a third DisplayPort, HDMI or even DVI-D with the right adapter. Finally, the card is PCIe 4.0 compatible, but works just fine in PCIe 3.0 slots too. For power, you get two 8-pin inputs on both cards, with AMD recommending a 650 watt PSU for the 6800, rising to 750 for the 6800 XD. Quite reasonable for mid to high-end graphics hardware. To get a better judgment of Big Navi's power efficiency while gaming, we used NVIDIA's platform agnostic PCAT system, an interposer board that sits between the graphics card and the motherboard and the power inputs to measure actual power consumption. When twinned with in-game performance metrics like frame rate, we can calculate exactly how many joules are required to render each frame and thereby get a measure of real-world efficiency. AMD cites a 54% improvement in performance per watt between RDNA and RDNA2. So how does the testing bear this out? And how does Nvidia's Ampere architecture compare? In Death Stranding, AMD's RDNA2 architecture is more efficient than Nvidia's Ampere and significantly better than first-gen RDNA. Uh, and we're using the 5700 XT here for comparison purposes. And yeah, you can see that we are getting close to AMD's claimed efficiency gains. However, this game is very kind to AMD hardware. So what about a more balanced option? In Gears 5, the 3070 provides better competition against 6800 and proves to be the slightly more efficient card, although the margin is just 5% in Nvidia's favor. Clearly, both new architectures are significantly more power efficient than their predecessors, which speaks to the quality of the engineering that has gone into both options. Interestingly, RX 6800 XT requires 15 to 20% more power per frame in the two games we tested. So the more compact 6800 is definitely the series leader in terms of power efficiency. We saw a similar margin between 3070 and 3080, so this kind of differential, it's hardly unexpected. Okay, so let's dig into actual performance here, kicking off with Borderlands 3, the Unreal Engine 4 powered first person shooter whose benchmark sequence has emerged as a bizarre standard bearer of sorts for the potential of next gen graphics hardware. And I'm grouping together the GPUs at the moment in this review, the upgrade options of the here and now in one big shootout. So 3080, 3070, they're taking on 6800 XT and 6800. And yeah, Borderlands was the game that demonstrated 3080's biggest generational leap over 2080. So although the margins are wafer thin here at 4K, 3080 is beaten by 6800 XT. 2.5% on average, but it's still a win. More interesting is the 6800 versus 3070 comparison, where AMD delivers a 20.5% advantage. These numbers actually increase at 1440p, where the 6800 gains a couple of points, uh, but the 6800 XT advantage increases to 11%. Seems to me like the Infinity Cache is doing a great job of getting more performance out of a very constrained memory interface, but its effectiveness drops the higher you go with resolution. 
Still though, an AMD win. And an AMD win on a game that was used to showcase Nvidia's performance bump over its previous generation. That's interesting, but it's hardly the full story as we move on to Remedy's control, where the new AMD cards aren't quite living up to expectations. Our benchmark sequence here centers on the opening moments of the game, incorporating two cutscenes and some traversal. The game doesn't have a benchmark, and this is the closest we can get to a sustained, like-for-like, -like, repeatable sequence. The results are flipping here somewhat spectacularly, with the RTX 3080 delivering a 23% performance uplift over 6800 XT. A remarkable state of affairs. And what this means is that the 6800 also suffers what we'll find to be a very rare loss against RTX 3070, with the Nvidia GPU two percentage points ahead. I'd say it's more of a technical win, to be honest, as for the most part, performance is identical in the run. And at 1440p, the 6800 is actually 2% ahead of 3070, while the 3080's lead diminishes to 17%. So this is kind of like worst case scenario uh, for AMD here. 6800 XT doesn't cut it, 6800 does. Well, it does until you factor in DLSS, which takes AMD out of the fight completely. So you see, this next-gen GPU face-off is somewhat problematic to assess in the traditional fashion when AMD doesn't have a game-changing feature that Nvidia does. But regardless, the question I kept coming back to, looking at benchmarks like this, is it actually a relevant benchmark if an Nvidia user can and should use DLSS? It's a tricky one, but let's park it for a moment and look at Shadow of the Tomb Raider where there are differences that kind of sum up the key points of difference for the GeForce and Radeon contenders here. Starting with 4K, Shadow shows the 3080 clearly ahead of 6800 XT. The extent of the difference varies within each of the three segments here, but fundamentally it's a net 7.5 point lead for Nvidia. Meanwhile, 6800 powers ahead of 3070 to the tune of 14%. But at 1440p, 6800 XT is effectively on par with 3080, while the 6800 sees its lead increase to a huge 17%. So at this point, my takeaway is this. If we factor out next gen features, um, well, they're kind of current gen features now, surely. There's simply no doubt that the 6800 non-XT may well have a price premium over the 3070, but its performance uplift is undeniable. Meanwhile, the XT is looking less compelling it's a bit cheaper than the 3080, but at the premium high end, I'd want those next gen features. Or else, a big performance win, which, let's be honest, I'm not getting. We'll talk about the VRAM side of things in a bit, uh, but suffice to say, it makes no real impact for the 6800 XT over the 3080 in any of our benchmarks in the here and now at least. Doom Eternal next, another high level performer for Nvidia and it's basically a rinse and repeat situation for the 3080 against 6800 XT. Seven point lead for Team Green. Once again though, the non-XT delivers a 14.5% lead over 3070. Interestingly, this does actually drop a bit at 1440p rather than increase, which is what I expected. But what I think is happening here is that the 3070 is VRAM limited with ultra nightmare textures at 4K for a portion of the benchmark. At 1440p, the 3070 doesn't have to contend with that, narrowing the gap. 3080 still beats 6800 XT at 1440p, but with a 3.5 percentage lead, not really a big deal. Regardless though, I think the issue is that when you're paying $700 for a card, you're not gonna be swayed by a $50 price reduction for a competing product, especially when real world pricing varies so much. Yeah, pricing, well, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Next up, let's talk Death Stranding. It's a game that on paper at least has always favored AMD hardware when you set up like for like workloads. Okay, okay, let's park for a moment that RTX users really should be using DLSS here for actual better than native image quality and let's just roll with the like for likes for now. If the Infinity Cache limits 4K performance, Death Stranding doesn't really care. The 6800 here is 18 points to the better against 3070, and you'd think that might possibly set up some challenges for the 3080 against the XT. However, the XT can only muster a two-point lead in our test segment. 
so the narrative starts to take shape of a 6800 that is easily a more powerful card up against 3070 in rasterization at least, but the 6800 XT cannot repeat the trick. At 1440p, 6800 XT extends its lead to 5.5%, but the 6800 actually reduces to around 12%. Curious stuff, but there we go. A good showing for AMD here, but only because once again we're totally ignoring DLSS, which is what I guess we should be doing in comparing like-for-like -like workloads, but it totally disregards the actual user experience where NVIDIA owners can upgrade their experience in both image quality and performance by using it. Yeah, it really is tricky, and it gets even trickier when we take a look at Metro Exodus's benchmark. Breaking out the bar charts, I can see that at 4K, 3080 commands an 8 percentage point lead over the 6800 XT, with the base 6800 about 5% faster than 3070. So yes, this does reinforce the narrative that 6800 uh, is a very, very impressive product against 3070, while the XT isn't quite good enough to take down the 3080 flagship. The numbers don't lie here, but looking at the actual performance graphing, the advantages of both of the top performers in their respective classes actually changes according to context. In different workloads, the different architectures excel in different areas. So this would be an interesting example to take into actual gameplay. All the more fascinating at 1440p where, as expected, 6800 XT pulls back a few points and becomes more competitive. But try as I might, I just don't see the XT as a 1440p card. Right now, at least, the non-XT just seems to be a better fit for that resolution. So look, I could go on with rasterization performance, but the narrative isn't going to change. We've got all of the numbers you'll need in our Eurogamer text review flagged in the video description below with its fancy interactive bar charts and frame time visualizations. But the story is really simple. 6800 non-XT costs more than 3070, but you are getting more performance. Good for 4K, great for 1440p. In fact, I really think it's not a great idea to go beyond 3070 or 6800 class products at 1440p because look, Hitman 2 here, it's a somewhat extreme visualization, but it shows that you will hit CPU limits. And yeah, this is using a system with a Core i9-10900K running all threads at 5 gigahertz. And if the 6800 is a 1440p card, I wonder whether AMD shouldn't have gone for the jugular, cut back VRAM allocation to 8 gigs, and give that cash investment there back to the user. Right now, I can't help but think that 16 gigs is not really worthwhile for a card of this performance class. We only have one benchmark that shows a VRAM limitation on 3070, and pairing back textures in Doom Eternal from Ultra Nightmare to Ultra sorts the issue with very little impact to visual quality. Meanwhile, 6800 XT is cheaper than 3080, but by and large it's also slightly slower. 16 gigs of memory, Perhaps more understandable in this price bracket, but again, there's not a workload in our benchmark suite that says that the 10 gigs that the 3080 has isn't enough, in the here and now at least. Meanwhile, DLSS certainly is a here and now consideration. AMD has its own solution in the works, but no real information has been released about it, apart from PC Games Hardware managing to confirm that it's not using the AI extensions to the RDNA 2 shaders. So it's not a machine learning solution, which suggests a temporal super sampling style technique. And if it's not using AI, it's not related to Microsoft's ongoing research for AI upscaling. Xbox system architect Andrew Goosen told me that this is still very active research for them. Now, whatever they do have cooking, it could transition across to PC as RDNA 2 does have the same machine learning features as Xbox series consoles. But let's make no bones about it, this isn't the AMD solution. All of which leads us on to ray tracing, which is a part of the RDNA2 architecture. And here, any and every RT title on the market right now, previously exclusive to NVIDIA, but running on the DXR API should run on RDNA2, and the question is, how fast? What we do know from the Series X disclosures is that less of the RT process gets hardware acceleration from AMD with less of a silicon investment. And when you look at RDNA 2's 128 megabyte infinity cache, well, that's where AMD's priority is. Investing die area 
into a rasterization performance boost and potentially saving on the area required by further memory controllers. So we've been looking at the Metro Exodus Bench, 1440p, no DLSS, everything ramped up to ultra. And well, wow, NVIDIA is literally a class apart. I find this graphing intriguing because 6800 XT by and large maps with 3070. They jostle for position. 3070 has a small 2% lead, but it's even really. But by extension, that gives the 3080 a gigantic 34% performance advantage over the XT. Now, path tracing, it's the purest form of ray tracing. We usually use Quake 2 RTX uh, to test this, but because that uses NVIDIA exclusive extensions, we can't use AMD cards on it for now. Vulkan itself now has official support, so hopefully this situation will change soon. But in the meantime, we're gonna move on to Remedies Control. Already subpar in rasterization performance, Alex Battaglia's Corridor of Doom is a bloodbath. 3070 beats 6800 XT by 16.5%. 3080 monsters it with a 64% lead. And of course, this is compounded because remember, in the real world, NVIDIA users would be nuts not to use DLSS on this title, which actually improves image quality over native resolution rendering. Battlefield 5 next, and this actually saw more mediocre performance increases for NVIDIA, gen on gen. And in rasterization terms, it's certainly AMD friendly. But the readout here is not good for RDNA 2. 3080 beats 6800 XT by 41%, and even the 3070 is 10% faster. You know, at the moment, we're breaking out RT benchmarks compared to standard rasterization benchmarks. But there's going to come a point where RT is baked in at the engine level. And this separation, well, you know, it's not really going to be valid. And at that point, that's really going to hurt these cards, these new cards from AMD. And in a world where Watch Dogs Legion launches on consoles and PC with ray tracing, where even Xbox Series S, a $250 console, gets RT features, well, we're swiftly approaching the point where this segregation in RT shouldn't really be happening. For now, in a time of transition, fair enough, but even so, with a GPU purchase supposed to last for, what, two or three years generally, I can't see a scenario where RT won't be crucial within that time period. So the lack of relative performance on AMD here is disappointing. But on the flip side, what it does mean is that we may see more scalability in RT modes. I'd recommend watching Alex's Watch Dogs Legion PC vs. Console Ray Tracing video to see the kind of optimizations Ubisoft made to get ray tracing working quite nicely on the less capable consoles. And I'd certainly like to see those options used on PC to allow for RT to run on a wider range of graphics hardware. One of the more interesting additions to Radeon RX 6000 series cards is Smart Access Memory, SAM, S-A-M which is AMD's branded implementation of the PCI Express resizable bar feature baked into recent builds of Windows 10 and Linux. SAM allows supported processors to directly access all 16 gigs of video memory on the 6800 or XT, bypassing the usual 256 megabytes IO buffer limit and thereby increasing performance in some games. AMD showed frame rate gains in the region of 2 to 10% in their announcement event, depending on the game and the resolution. Again, our full results are in the Eurogamer article, and right now, actual hardware configurations that support it are limited. But from my perspective, I only saw two real highlights. While there was no real performance improvement at 4K resolution, Borderlands 3 at 1440p saw an 8% rise in performance, increasing to an impressive 12% at 1080p. With Remedies Control, which needs all of the boosts it can get, there does seem to be an improvement in lowest 1% scores at 4K, but the real gains were at 1440p, where there was a 4.2% advantage, rising to 5.5 at 1080p. So there's clearly something here, and I hope to see more. Of course, the current range of hardware supported is very limited, and you will need a Ryzen 5000 setup. Meanwhile, NVIDIA says that its own rendition of SAM is coming and it'll work on all processors. So I guess we'll have to see about that. So wrapping up, this one is simple enough. I think even though there are so many different mitigating variables, I'm kind of reminded of Vega 56 and 64 actually. The lower end card brought the value, 
and actually beat Nvidia in a key market segment. I thought it was a good offering. Things are a bit different this time around, bearing in mind the RT and machine learning situation. And you can't ignore that this time the card is more expensive, but still I'm getting good Vega 56 level vibes from the 6800. It's a good product, no doubt about it. The XT does achieve something extremely important. It sends out the message that AMD can get close to top tier Nvidia performance. It can do it with improved efficiency and a lower power budget, almost acts as a kind of watch this space style statement of intent. But what it doesn't do, far from it, is knock out the competition. Given the choice between a lower price point and more RAM, up against more performance and far, far superior RT and machine learning features, well, for me at least, the choice is a lot easier. So going for AMD in the high end basically means you're betting on a lower cost price and higher memory allowance versus overall better performance and much improved next gen features. At the 6800 level, you're betting on better rasterization performance and more RAM, but this time you are paying a premium for it. Well, that's assuming you can actually get MSRP or close to it on any of these products where supply is extremely limited at the moment. But you see where I'm heading here. I don't think that Big Navi is delivering a Ryzen moment. Nvidia simply isn't as complacent as Intel was. And there is no Ryzen 5 3600 equivalent here, a product that delivers so much at such an excellent price point that you simply can't ignore it. Things are much closer in the graphics space. But in terms of an overall trend for AMD's technological progress, Big Navi is basically a triumph. The Infinity Cache is paying off, allowing AMD to use less performant memory and a more narrow bus and still bring the fight to Team Green. Power efficiency, this has been a problem on stock untuned AMD cards for a long, long time. But what AMD's engineers have achieved here is highly impressive. Also, if you look at scalability between Little Navi, RX 5700 XT, and the newer, bigger Navi equivalents, not only is power efficiency massively improved, but performance scaling XT versus XT it's usually like 90% or higher. And this is like massively impressive, I'd say, as a gen on gen gain. So there are definite wins here, signs of immense progress from Radeon. And while competitive at the top end, AMD hasn't quite got there, nor fully got to grips with the next gen features challenge laid down by Nvidia. 6800 though, well, if you disagree with us about the importance of machine learning and RT features, well, there's no doubt it's a hugely impressive product it's going to be really difficult to ignore. But that's all from me for now. And you all know the score. Please like, subscribe, share, and all of that business. Plus bell ringing. It's an option that ensures you'll be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts new content. The DF Patreon is there for those who want to see our content the way it's meant to be seen via pristine quality video downloads. Somewhat useful in a world where YouTube's encoders seem to be really struggling right now to deliver 4K and even high quality 1080p. But really, we like to think it's more about supporting the team more directly, gaining access to our Discord and all of that loveliness. But that's it. That's the video. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And of course, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. Don't lose players to game errors and crashes. Instability will happen throughout the game development cycle during playtesting, beta cycles, or after you've released. Backtrace was developed to automate the capture and analysis of crashes, hangs, and non-fatal errors across PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, PC, Mac, Stadia, and more. Our unique data platform allows you to index anything, integrate with Gyra, Slack, Discord, and run analytic workloads to better prioritize and understand your game's stability. Many of the industry's AAA studios depend on Backtrace. You should too. Click on the link in the video description and sign up for your free trial today.